Welcome to 3ABN's Sabbath School panel. We are on lesson number four in our new quarter entitled Offerings for Jesus. What does that mean? Well, if you stay around long enough, you'll find out. But before we go any further, let me introduce our family today that's going to walk you through this wonderful lesson that's designed to strengthen our stewardship as it relates to our relationship to Christ. To my immediate left is Daniel Perrin in our pastoral department. Good to have you here. Thank you. Happy to be here. And I have Monday's lesson, which is what portion for offerings? Oh, that's something always, something people try to figure out. But right there, Ryan Day. Ryan is in the middle. Are you going <laughs> to sing today? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going <laughs> to sing, but I certainly have Tuesday's lesson entitled Offerings and Worship. Okay. And Jill... Everywhere I go, they call you the list lady. What do you have for us today, Jill? <laughs> well, we might have a list. We have a few takeaways, but Wednesday we're looking at God takes note of our offerings. And always good to have Danny here. Danny, Thank are you. you ready? Oh, I, well, I think so. Probably ready as ever, but I have Thursday's lesson and it's big jar giving. Big jar nice. giving. Okay, kind of like when you're growing up, you break that piggy bank when you want to yeah, use it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Danny, would you have our prayer for us today? Before I will. We Let's do that. Lord, we thank you for your many wonderful blessings to us. And today we ask and pray for anointing of the Holy Spirit that everything that's said and done will be done to your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Danny. By the way, I have a copy of the lesson. If you don't have a copy, uh, you should be able to get one locally. But um, follow us along today in this wonderful study. And we are on Sunday. And this offerings for Jesus. Here it is. I want to begin with the premise that the lesson brings out. Now, we spent a lot of time on tithe. Mm -hmm. We talked about tithing, what percentage you give on, do you pay on your, do you return on your gross or on your net? But this lesson is going to be focusing on offerings because when you give the 10% back to the Lord that belongs to him, you've got 90%. And the question is, what do you do with that? Do you want God to bless that? Do you handle it frivolously? Is it just yours to do whatever you want? Or are you still accountable to God because all of it belongs to him? The lesson brings out on the Sabbath afternoon portion. It says, besides tithing, there are offerings that come from the 90% that remains in our possessions after our tithe is returned to God. This is where generosity <clears throat> begins. Different types of offerings were given by God's people, such as sin offering given in response to God's grace or thank offering, given to recognize God's protection and blessings of health, prosperity and sustaining power. There also were offerings for the poor and offerings that build and maintain the house of worship. And in our church, we have offerings. Many of you know that sometimes we say this week is for pathfinders or this week is for women's ministries or this week for evangelism. We call those trust funds at the local church level. But nonetheless, you've got to pray about what you do with that 90% because you're still accountable to that. And there's a quotation from uh, Councils on Stewardship, page 18, that um, uh, G. Edward Reed uses to lay the foundation for the lesson. He says, we love God because he first loved us. Our giving is in response to his amazing gift to us, Jesus. In fact, we are told the Lord does not need our offerings. We cannot enrich him by our gifts. Says the psalmist, all things come of thee and of thine own have we give thee, given thee. In other words, we give God what belongs to him. I think Ryan pointed that out on a prior lesson. You're building God's temple with gold and silver, but it belongs to him. Mm -hmm. It says, yet God permits us to show our appreciation of his mercies by self-sacrificing efforts to extend the same to others. This is the only way in which it is possible for us to manifest our gratitude and love to God. He has provided no other. So watch this. We get 10 tenths. One tenth go back to, goes back to God. And then you become the conduit of blessings to others, either in your congregation, in your community. We also have a benevolent fund mm -hmm. where there are people in our local community that have needs periodically. We have a fund for church members that go through hardships. All these are levels of accountability. But now let's go to Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 to 34. And when you talk about that, we're going on Sunday's lesson now, Motivation for Giving. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 to 34, brings us into a, a strong picture, simply saying that when you are a person of stewardship responsibility, these are the things that you don't have to be concerned with. Verses 31. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? 
well, what shall we drink? Mm -hmm. Well, what shall we wear? Mm -hmm. For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But look at the key. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And how many things? All. Oh. All these things shall be added to you. So when we do the first thing, you know, first things first, when we seek God's kingdom first, then the Lord pr promises to provide our need. And then he ends by saying, Matthew ends by saying in verse 34, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own troubles. And when it comes to needs, sometimes people are concerned, what am I going to do tomorrow? How are my bills going to be paid? How are my children's tuitions going to be met? Where's my car payment, my house payment going to come from? I remember when we lived up in the uh, Weaverville, up in the mountains in our just second year of ministry, uh, my wife had a job at the hospital, a temporary job. And when that job ended, my salary was $500 a month. And prior to that, my car payment was three forty nine. Do the math. Wow. <laughs> so one Sabbath morning, I was faced with this confrontation and my my insurance money was due on Monday for my car insurance, which was seventy five dollars. So you do the math. Three forty nine uh, out of five hundred plus minus seventy five dollars. And then my tithe and offerings was also seventy five dollars. So I was caught between do I return my tithe and offering? Or do I pay my car insurance, which will be canceled the moment I don't pay it? And I got into this negotiating with the Lord on Sabbath morning. Now, remember, I'm the young preacher. It's my first church. And I was talking to God before I left the parsonage, which was like a, about 20 feet behind the church. And I said, OK, Lord, you know, my insurance is due on Monday. I'm going to skip tithe and offerings this week, catch up on it later. But I have to pay my car insurance. And I got into the church. I was walking behind the elder. And this was a learning experience that changed the way my attitude was toward giving to God. And as I was about to mount the rostrum, this little small church, I heard the Lord say to me, if you can't trust me, you can't speak for me. Mm. 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 That's good. And I sat down. I thought, wow, oh, that's not God, that's not fair. I mean, like, could you say that after the sermon? <laughs> it was like, if you can't trust me, you cannot speak for me. And I had my checkbook in my pocket and I took it out kind of like almost in a ceremonious way, like, OK, God, I'm writing the tithe check. And I'm putting it in the offering plate, almost like to say, God, this is really like well, you're putting me in a pickle. Praise God. That evening when I went to the post office, someone sent me a check for two hundred and thirty eight dollars, mm -hmm. which tripled what I returned <clears throat> to God. And uh, and it really was a rebuke that God is saying once again, if you can't trust me, you cannot speak for me. And so this was a challenge that the children of Israel had. Let's go to Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter uh, 28 and look at this. The Lord promises to bless his people if they are faithful to him. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 down to verse 7. It's all the way down to verse 14, but I don't have enough time. I want to just pull the gist out of this. It says in verse one, now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. Why? Because you obeyed the voice of the Lord your God. So what the Lord is in essence saying, what he said to Israel is true to us today. If we obey God and one of the greatest challenges we have in this materialistic world is obeying God financially. Hmm. I mean, think about it. How many people watching and listening have credit card debt? Mm -hmm. What kind of interest do they charge you? They don't charge you 10 percent interest. If you're really, really good, you can negotiate with your banks to bring it down below that. But in many cases today, 21 percent, 24 percent, 27 percent. And still people are putting themselves in debt, but none of those debt collectors will say to you what God has said to the children of Israel. I will bless you if you are faithful. Mm -hmm. So we talked about this, I think, in the prior program, and I cannot hesitate to reiterate this. Try to be debt free and because the borrower is a slave to the lender. And when those bills come, as has happened in the past, if you miss it one day, you get that phone call when you see 800 666 423, you know, they're calling you. Where's my money? Mm. Well, God is patient with us. Mm. But if you are diligent and obey the Lord, if you read the rest of the verses down to 14, you'll see that the Lord on the flip side of that, if we're not faithful, 
God withholds his blessings. So let me bring out a few points. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 and 7. And this is now the principle behind offering. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 7. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful, cheerful. cheerful giver. That's right. when, that means, you know, when you look at the Greek, it means you're almost giddy. You're happy to give to God. Sure, Lord, when you think about all the benefits that God brings to you, you're not saying, okay, here, Lord, that's not, that's not cheerful. You're saying, Lord, this belongs to you. I have no reticent spirit. I have no hesitation. This belongs to you. I'm, pl I'm pleased to give it to you. So let's look at four points I want to bring here before we go about the conditions of the heart that determine our liberality when it comes to returning to God. Number one, love for God is the motive that should motivate all of us, love for God. And where does that come from? John 3, 16, God gave because of his love for us and we too give because of our love for him. If love is not, a mo not the motivation, we should give, and this is the phrase I want you to remember, disinterested benevolence. Mm -hmm. Don't give saying, okay, now that I gave, you give me back. No, that's disinterested. Give expecting nothing in return mm -hmm. because if you expect something in return, then God is saying, I'll withhold it just to test your heart. Mm -hmm. The second one, desire to aid in the finishing of his work. Second Peter 1 verse 3, as, is, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Now God has given us everything we need in our spiritual walk, we should be similarly motivated to give everything that the, war, the work of the Lord needs, that the gospel will be proliferated. And many times the work of God, whether here at 3ABN or in your church or in other ministries, it's hindered by the heart that is not motivated to give. You know, we always say to our viewers and listeners, thank you for your prayers and your financial support. And we mean that mm -hmm. because that's how the work of God goes forward. That's how 3ABN can make 38 years because of the right heart attitude. Number three, strengthen the laborers. Matthew 7, verse 2, with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. If you give liberally, you'll receive liberally. If you give grudgingly, God will give you grudgingly. If you put one measure, you'll get one measure back. Giving is reciprocal. As you give, you receive. And finally, a sense of community and response. Ephesians 4 verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, mm. for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. When you use your offerings in the way that God intends, the blessings will come. Amen. Thank you. I'm Daniel Perrin and I have Monday's lesson what portion for offerings? In other words, what amount should I be giving to God? And the word portion here is not an accidentally used word. Could have been what percentage or what amount. Mm. But as you look through the Bible, looking up that word portion, you find out that it's a special word. And I'd like to take you to Lamentations chapter 3, verse 24, where we see that word used. And it says, The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. So we return to God a portion, but he's already given to us a portion. And that portion is all of him. And that's good news that there's no way that our giving will ever equal what God has given to us. Yeah. Returning tithe is simple to calculate, just moving one decimal one direction. But is there a calculation for offerings? Is there some target I should be aiming for? I know that when you fill out a, a budget for your monthly expenses, uh, there's some targets, like no more than 30% for housing. But what about offerings? What do we do here? At the heart, offerings and giving is not an issue of calculation. Generosity is not a math issue, mm -hmm. but uh, even if you have a hard time with fractions, even if you hate percentages, you can do generosity because God can lead you in this. You'll use a calculator for a monthly budget. There's a whole different tool that you will use when you think about, what do I give to the Lord? So we start, instead of asking, what shall I give to God? We start with the question, what have I received from God? Mm. And that puts us in a whole different frame of mind. Listen to a couple of texts here. The first one, Psalm 36, verse 5, your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Yes. And that's pretty high. 
Psalm 139, verse 17 and 18. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. Hmm. Psalm 31, staying with the Psalms, verse 19. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you. Now, we lay things aside for God, but imagine God has laid up blessings for us. Mm. And then concluding with Psalm 103, verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Mm. Right. Yeah. Now, these verses just get us started. They get us rolling. And then you get specific in your life. What is the Lord doing for me now? What has he done in the past? Past generations that have prepared blessings for me. And then our heart is in the frame, right framework where we're primed and ready to say, Lord, what can I give to you? And so we go to two texts here for some principles. And the first one is in Deuteronomy chapter 16, where Moses is sharing some principles from God about orienting your life toward him. So Deuteronomy 16, verse 16 and 17. It says, three times in a year shall all your males appear before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose at the feast of unleavened bread and at the feast of weeks and at the feast of tabernacles. And they shall not be appear before the Lord empty handed. Mm. Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. Mm -hmm. So three things from this text. Number one we shall not appear before the Lord empty handed. We've got to give something. Now God desires our words of praise and gratitude, but God desires something beyond that. He cares about our head, worshiping him with a right knowledge. He cares about our heart, worshiping him with, uh, with feeling and devotion, but God cares about our hands, our action, because they declare our loyalty and who we are and what we believe in. Listen to this text, and I know we've heard it before. Malachi chapter three, verse eight says, in what way have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? Now, many times before I've gone home and somebody at home says, hey, did you notice what we did? And I look around and honestly, I don't notice what they did. And the fact that I don't respond to whatever it was they did says that I didn't notice it and it was unimportant. And so our offerings are our act of noticing. Now, tithing is not our giving to God. Tithing is returning. Someone were to give me a gift and say, here's a gift for you. I open it up and inside there's a tool that they borrowed from me. Well, they didn't give me anything. They returned something to me that was already mine. And the extension of this principle is that when we tithe off of our income, we're not giving to God anything. And if all we do is tithe, then we're not giving any gift of gratitude to God for what he has done. Now, those sound like strong words, and they are because God doesn't want you to be denied or me to be denied of, of the blessing of giving. And so we have to begin by seeing our 90% after tithe as our true 100%. And then we say, Lord, I'm going to give you something. I'm not going to come empty handed. And number three in this, two in this text, three times a year they appear before God. Their whole life was oriented around traveling to the temple. And they didn't just give online or anonymously from their pocket, nothing wrong with that. But they carried on their backs or on a, an animal or in a wagon their gifts. And every step they carried it, they were saying, this is from God. He's given it to me. And they did it systematically, not if there was some left over at the end of the year, but as soon as their harvest was, was reaped, they brought it into God. And then finally from this text, as you were able, according to the blessing of God, God chooses the time for the giving in this text and he chooses the place, but we have the privilege of with God choosing how much and where we give it. We say, Lord, it's your money. You know the needs that are out there. Lead me about where I should place your money because of what you've done for me. Mm -hmm. And quickly, let's go to one more text in Psalm chapter 16, verse 12 to 14. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? What shall I give him? And the answer comes, Verse 13, I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. 
notice it didn't begin by talking about money at all mm -hmm. because money is not the issue. How do I thank God for what he's given? By taking his gift, by taking up the salvation that he's given me, by contemplating the cross and meditating upon what he wants to do in my life, by letting the cross penetrate every dark and hidden corner and reveal the sin that's in there and gladly, willingly, lead, yielding it up to him and saying, Lord, sanctify me, change my heart. The gift I give to God is to say, I've got nothing to return to you except the willingness to take what you give. John 3, 16 says, God has loved you so much that he gave. The answer to what we should give is not giving, it's living. God wants a life dedicated to him. And out of that is going to overflow a gift of gratitude. Uh, the next part of the verse says, I will pay my vow. A vow is not an impulsive gift because the sermon was good or the need was there in my face. A vow is premeditated. It's contemplated. And didn't God premeditate the gift that he gave to you? That's right. I think about Romans 1 that says uh, the gospel of God, right there in the beginning paragraph, that he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Mm -hmm. God thought in advance about what you need and met your need before it was even there. And so we then, we premeditate as we contemplate the cross. We say, Lord, what is it that I can give because of what you've done for me? Help me to change my priorities. Help them to be more in line with the things that you want. Lord, in my relationships, is there any way that I can use them to honor you and lift you up? Can I let go of expensive and time-consuming hobbies that only please me and use what you've given me to further your kingdom? Lord, are there any priorities in my life that you'd like to modify so by taking up the cup of salvation, I can live in such a way that you really are the king of my life, the one who gives me all good gifts. So how much? What is the percentage? Should we feel guilty if, if we're not giving to a certain level? Well, you can search through the Bible and you can look for a number and you'll find one for tithing. 10%, that's so clear. But you're not gonna find a number for offerings because God says, I can't tell you what to give. Mm. Then it's not a gift. It's a demand and a requirement. And when you're close with God, you're naturally like a close friend, you're gonna desire to give, not as a grudge, but as a, a, a gift out of love. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much. Amen. Well, we have so much more to cover. Wonderfully said. I like that. It's not a percentage. It's an attitude. Thank you so much for that. We'll be back in just a moment for our next offering or our next offering of lesson study, which is going to be offerings and worship. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're going to go to Tuesday, Ryan Day, Offerings and Worship. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor and Daniel. Great, great start of the lesson. I'm Ryan Day and I have Tuesday's lesson. As Pastor mentioned, Offerings and Worship is the title. And, uh, you know, as I was studying through this lesson, something came to my mind because... Um, Oftentimes, while I'm not a big social media person, every, every once in a while I'll get on my Facebook and, you know, check some messages that's sent to me and, you know, look at, you know, try to catch up with some of my friends. And, and uh, there was a, uh, I guess, a, a message or a meme of some kind that was kind of floating around out there not too long ago, a few months back. And it caught my eye when I saw it. And I immediately just thought, wow. And, and this is what it was. And I noticed there was a bunch of people sharing it. It was kind of one of those things that was going viral. And uh, it, it was a little meme. And the word simply said, if money is the root of all evil, then why does the church keep asking for it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Why is the church always asking for it? 
and immediately I just kind of rolled my eyes, you know, because again, people who come up with these things and write these things and put it out there, number one, they don't know their Bibles. You can tell they're not true biblical Christians. These are haters. These are people that uh, they, they are sour in spirit and they uh, are not fully educated about what the true message is in regards to offerings and worship. <clears throat> and, uh, and yes, are there people out there that sometimes misuse and abuse this beautiful gift, this beautiful uh, principle that we are to follow? Absolutely. We're not going to sit here and say that there aren't some churches and there aren't some uh, individuals out there that are misusing and abusing uh, this gift. But yet at the same time, we still have to follow the biblical principles. And uh, on Tuesday's lesson, Offerings and Worship, uh, the lesson brings out that, you know, the Bible doesn't necessarily give us an order of worship. In other words, the sequence and the way things are supposed to be done in the worship service itself. But it does highlight at least four major aspects, which we try to include in our worship services. And that's things like, you know, the study time, the preaching time, prayer, music, and of course, tithe and offering. And uh, Brother Daniel actually mentioned one of the texts that the lesson brings out on Tuesday also. So we're going to jump back to Deuteronomy chapter 16. He read them so beautifully and he gave a beautiful commentary on that. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but just reiterate uh, uh, what is expressed here in Deuteronomy chapter 16, beginning with verse 16. And um, before we read those texts, before we read this particular text, I just want to highlight that uh, if you study the biblical, uh, the biblical feast days, in other words, the Jewish feast days, and I say the Jewish feast days because we can support that in the New Testament. When you get over to the book of John, John, especially as a gospel writer, he highlights every time he mentions one of the feasts, he always calls it the Jewish feast of Passover, the Jewish feast of Tabernacles, the Jewish feast of Pentecost. So he's always highlighting this is a Jewish feast. This is something that God gave to the nation of Israel to bring them into convocation, to bring them into worship and to remind them to, to, to remain in relationship with Him, especially uh, in regards to keeping His commandments and remaining to be His obedient people. And so there were seven major feasts that are mentioned in Scripture. If you do your research, you'll find out that that in order is Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost or Feast of Weeks. You have Feast of Trumpets, the feast or the, the time which is known as Yom Kippur, it's the Day of Atonement, holiest day of the Jewish calendar. And of course, the last one of the year, which is known as the Feast of Booths or of Tabernacles. Now, you'll notice that Passover, unleavened bread and fruits, they all come within the context of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is a week long feast. And it starts with Passover. Then you have the fe a con continuation of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and then it ends with the Feast of First Fruits. And of course, uh, in the midst of all of these comes Pentecost some weeks later. I only bring that up because when we read Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 16 and 17, again, what Daniel read earlier, uh, let's just read those again and kind of remind ourselves of what God asks of His people. And this same principle is found carried over in the New Testament as well in regards to worship and returning tithe and offering uh, given by God. So Deuteronomy chapter 16, beginning with verse 16 and 17. It says, three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord, your God in the place which he chooses at the feast of unleavened bread, at the feast of weeks, which we just learned is Pentecost, and at the feast of tabernacles. And they shall not, excuse me, yes, they shall not appear before the Lord empty handed. I love that. Uh, don't come empty handed. Okay, right? You're going to return to the Lord what is his. And then verse 17 says, every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. Now we highlight this because of those seven feasts, as the text brings out here, there were three particular feasts that they actually, the men of the families actually had to leave their homes wherever they were. And remember, even when we get into Acts chapter two, remember it says devout Jews out of every nation. Remember when the the 12 tribes split over in the New Testament, or excuse me, over in the Old Testament, when those 12 tribes split and, and, and you know, the, the, the king of the north, or excuse me, the kingdom of the north and the kingdom of the south, and all of that began to, to disintegrate over time, all of the peoples began to spread and they were carried off by the Assyrians into all different nations so that by the time you get to the times of Christ, to the, uh, the first century church, there were Jews all over the place in different nations, which is why Acts 2 brings out the fact that there were devout Jews out of every nation under the 
the son coming to this feast. It was one of those feasts that, yes, the men had to be there present and appear before the Lord there. At, at one of those was Pentecost or the feast, feast of weeks. I, want to, I just want to highlight this and, and just bring this out very clearly because, and I actually made a note. I, I highlighted it here right here where it says, shall appear before the Lord. When you're talking about offerings and worship, which is the title of Tuesday's lesson, when you're talking about offerings and worship, one of the greatest offerings that you can present before your Lord is you. That's good. Mm -hmm. Is you. Mm -hmm. Yes, we live in a modern age where, you know, yes, when it says here, do not appear before the Lord empty handed, you know, um, technology has increased and praise the Lord. I was actually just was, was looking at it in just a moment on my, on my iPad here. Uh, we have this incredible app called Adventist Giving and it just makes it so much easier. So now, yes, you know what? It, it, this principle appearing before the Lord should be kept. If you can appear before the Lord and give, you should keep that principle. But the idea of, of, of returning tithe and offering, I mean, my goodness, you don't even have to appear in person anymore in the sense that you carry it physically with you. you there's so many great opportunities today in which you can return turn and give to the Lord. But the idea here that is expressed here that I want to highlight is the fact that we shall, we can, we should bring ourselves before the Lord in presence. And I just want to say, especially since COVID, COVID kind of, I mean, gave a sucker punch to the church where, I mean, I, I have had the privilege this past year since 2021 into 2022, the traveling and getting to go to different churches. And almost every pastor I talk to, they all say to me, yeah, you know, we used to have this many people coming to church, but most of the people haven't returned back since COVID. And, and that's, kind of, you know, I understand, you know, the fear of, you know, by trying to, you know, be safe and all that. But at the same time, you know what, we, we, we do, what God has not given us a spirit of fear. And God wants us to bring ourselves to appear before him. We should be, be brought together collectively to offer ourselves, if nothing else, before the Lord in worship, in corporate worship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And this offering in, in context with worship or in, in, uh, in parallel or in, within the context, of worship should be carried on. I was going to read through Leviticus 23. I don't have enough time. But if you read Leviticus 23, where God institutes and gives in great detail how each one of these feasts are to be carried out, it's amazing. I encourage you, go read Leviticus 23. Now, it's probably not going to be the most exciting read you've ever read before because there's a lot of details pertaining to, you know, this aspect and that aspect and this offering and this wave sheaf and this, all these different languages languages pertaining to the ceremonial aspect of these feasts. But when you read through here, I'm going to just kind of glean through really quickly and read some of the words. Tell me just at home, I just, and I know you're going to be communicating with me here. Tell me which word you hear the most coming up. I'm going to read just a few verses as I go through Leviticus 23. For instance, Leviticus 23 verse 8, but you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. In, in regards to the Feast of First Fruits, verse 9 of, of, of uh, excuse me, verse 10 of Leviticus 23, you shall bring a, she, a sheaf of first fruits. Mm, okay. Verse 12, and you shall offer on that day. All right. And then if you go down in that same verse, as a burnt offering to the Lord, verse 13, it's grain offering shall be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil and offering made by fire to the Lord. You'll get the point here. Verse 14, you, you notice, you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Uh, verse 15, in regards to Pentecost, uh, you, you, on that day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. Just a little bit further down, it says, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. Verse 18, and you shall offer the breads, uh, the bread, seven lambs of the first year. And then a little bit further down, a burnt offering, a grain offering, drink offerings, offering. <laughs> it disappears so many different times. Uh, going down a little bit further in verse 25, you shall offer an offering. This keeps appearing over and over. Why do we see this? In fact, if you count it up, uh, more than 30 times in this one passage, God is saying offer, 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 an offering, an offering, present an offering, because God wants us to, yes, bring ourselves up here before Him. It's a part of the worship. If we are going to properly worship Him, not only does He want us, but He wants us to return to Him what He has blessed us with out of faith, as Daniel and pastors brought out so clearly. It's a faith thing. Do you trust in Him? Are you thankful 
thankful for what God has provided for you. If you have, then you know what? Bring an offering to the Lord and give cheerfully as the Bible instructs us. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Ryan and Daniel and Pastor John. What an incredible study on offerings. I love that. I'm Jill Morricone. I have Wednesday's lesson, God Takes Note of Our Offerings offerings. We're going to look at two biblical examples of giving where God took note. They're both out of the ordinary. They're both unexpected. And yet God took note of these offerings. You could almost say they're both on the fringes of Jewish society. And yet God took note of their offerings. We're going first to the widow's might. So turn with me to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, we're going to pick up the story in verse 41. We have Pastor John's seven takeaways from both of these stories, four from the widow's mite, and then three from the following story. So the widow's mite were in Mark 12. You can also find the story in Luke 21, but we won't look at that. We're just going to Mark 12. We pick it up in verse 41. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in, what's that word? Much. Much. Takeaway number one, observation matters. God sees everything that's done. Mm -hmm. Jesus took note. God sees what's done in the open and he sees what's done in secret. He knows what we do and he knows why we do it. He sees the impression of the poor. He sees the injustice that's done. He sees the flagrant disobedience mm -hmm. to his Ten Commandments. He enters into our worship services and he sees what we give. And he sees not only what we give, but the motive in our heart and why we give. Let's look at verse 42. Then one poor widow came. Now remember the rich had given much. One poor widow came and threw in two mites, which makes a quadrant. Now, two mites was the smallest coin in circulation in Palestine at that time. And the two mites equaled one quadrant. One quadrant is the smallest Roman copper coin. It was worth just about one penny. Mm. That would be equal, they said at that time, for a day laborer, he would get 64 quadrants. So if you imagine, say he worked, I'm not super good at math, but say he worked an eight hour day, that means he'd get eight quadrants an hour, right? And she put in one quadrant. Mm -hmm. That's like seven minutes of work. We'd say that's almost nothing. Takeaway number two, everything matters. Mm -hmm. Nothing is too small to give to God. Mm -hmm. So many times we think we must give great things. I think, oh, I need to be a concert pianist like Tim Parton, or I can't bring my gift to God. I need to be a preacher like Pastor John Lomacain, or I can't bring my gift to God. I need to be a singer like Ryan Day, or I need to be a writer like Mr. Danny Shelton, or I can't bring my gift to God. But you know what? Everything matters. We have a prisoner who writes into 3ABN. Every time that I get his offering to God, I cry. He writes in fairly regularly, every couple months. And you know what? He doesn't have any money to give, but he has stamps. And he sends us an envelope with two stamps, mm. just mm -hmm. two stamps. Wow. Right. And he says, use these stamps in the Lord's work. You know what? Everything matters. Let's look at verse 43, Mark 12, 43. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury, for they put in out of their abundance. But she out of her poverty put in all that she had her whole livelihood. Mm -hmm. Takeaway number three, motive, it matters. She didn't give from her abundance. She gave from her need. She mm -hmm. gave all that she had. She gave from her heart. You see, the rich people gave out of obligation maybe, but she gave from her heart. Right. She gave from her poverty, not out of abundance, but out of poverty. She gave even when it hurt. This was the only monetary gift that Jesus ever commended in the Gospels. The gift was so small, you and I would consider it inconsequential. But yet motive matters to Jesus even more than the size of the gift. Mm 
The worth of her gift was not in the value of what she gave. It was in her love to God. It was in her interest in his work that prompted the gift. That's what mattered to God because motive, it matters. Mm -hmm. We also see takeaway number four, sacrifice matters. She gave her all. When we give to God, when we sacrifice to God's cause, it grows our cheerfulness. It grows our unselfishness. It grows our love for God and others. In our remaining time, let's look at the second story and we're going to Acts. Acts chapter 10, this is a story of Cornelius. And you would think, oh, he was a Roman centurion. What uh, can he teach us about giving? Quite a bit. We're in Acts chapter 10, verse 1. Now remember the gospel initially, the, the disciples thought it was for the Jews, only for the Jews, exclusive. They're not going to spread it to any Gentiles. We see in Acts chapter 8 that the gospel went to Samaria and the Ethiopian eunuch. Then we see in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius is almost the test case, you could say. He's the breakthrough or the precedent where one of the apostles realizes and recognizes. This would be the apostle Peter. He recognizes that the gospel is to go to the Gentiles as well. So we're in Acts 10 verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. He was a centurion. That means that he commanded a hundred Roman soldiers of what was called the Italian regiment. A devout man, one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. So how is Cornelius described here? Now he's a Roman, he's a heathen, mm -hmm. he's a pagan. And how is he described here? He feared God, he and all his household. He gave, what was the word used? Alms generously to the people. We've been talking the last lesson, we talked about the importance of returning our tithe to God. This lesson we're focusing on the importance of offerings to God. But I believe in addition to offerings to God, also we are to give to the poor. We are to help the needy. I know, Pastor John, the church has a benevolence fund mm -hmm. where those offerings go to help support the poor. And Cornelius did this. He did alms to the poor. And he also prayed to God always. So what's takeaway number one from Cornelius? Giving matters. You know, we applaud prayer. We say sermons are important in the life of a Christian. Prayer is important in the life of a Christian, yes. But giving, does giving matter? Luke chapter 10, verse 27, we find an important principle here. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and you shall love who? Your neighbor as yourself. You see, we re reveal our love to God by praying. We reveal our love for our neighbor by how we give how we give to help those who are in need. Takeaway number two, generosity matters. Now, what's interesting to me, it said Cornelius gave generously those alms to the poor. The previous story, we talked about the widow's might and how motive mattered. She gave almost nothing, but yet it mattered because she gave from her heart and that sacrifice and that motive mattered. In this case, we discover that generosity combined with the right motive, that that matters to God as well. Right. He gave generously that matter to God. Let's look at verse three. We're in Acts 10 verse three. About the ninth hour, that's 3 p.m. of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. Mm. And when he had observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. N uh, New Living Translation, if I can get that out, said your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Takeaway number three, others matter. Yes. Mm -hmm. Giving to the poor mm -hmm. is a part of worship. That's right. We are called, Matthew 25, to give to the least of these. So let's recap those seven takeaways from these two stories where God took note of their offerings. Observation matters. God sees everything that is done. Everything matters. Nothing is too small for God. Motive matters. Why we give 
matters to God. Sacrifice matters because giving sacrificially increases my unselfishness and it works in my own heart. Giving matters. Giving to the poor is just as important as prayer. Generosity matters. How much we give and the sacrifice and the heart with which we give matters. And finally, others matter. Giving to the poor is an act of worship, part of our offering to God. Amen. Thank you, Jill. I don't know about you all, but I think I, I can go home now. I've been so blessed <laughs> by, by this. This is amazing. Uh, my name is Danny Shelton, and I have Thursday's lesson, and it's called Big Jar Giving. So, you know, if there's a big jar, we're going to be talking about a little jar also. Research has shown that about 9% of our assets are what we call liquid assets. Now, what are those? It's something that we can give right away. If I go to church, Brother Ryan, and, and they ask for an offering, I can give it. But 90% or so of our assets are not in cash and saving mon money markets, all those. They're in possessions like maybe real estate, our, our uh, automobiles, other non-liquid. So today we've been talking about, I've learned so much about giving there's our tithe that you brought up so well. That's not a giving to God. You said that's a return. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very well put in your example. So what about our giving? What does God expect out of us today? Now, I heard this. I'm sure you've heard this conversation too. It's about a, a $20 bill. It's a worn out $20 bill and a worn out $1 bill. They somewhere meet along the line. And the $20 bill is saying, man, I don't know what you've done with your life, but I've been to Europe, I've been to Disney World, I've been to Vegas, I've been to all of these places around the world. I've traveled so much, and the one dollar bill's listening, and so he says to him, where have you been? He says, to church. Mm -hmm. So you get the point. The one dollar bill is what we <laughs> tend to give to church, where the twenty dollar bill we put for all these things that we like to do that's more worldly or secularly in so many ways. So now here at 3ABN, I can tell you that it's small jar giving that keeps us going, but it's the big jar giving that keeps us growing. Mm -hmm. So, and that happens all the time. Now we have like a few thousand people who give X amount of dollars a month. Let's say someone gives $50 a month, but somewhere during that course of the year, that same person, Jill, you find a check for $10,000. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? That comes out of the big jar giving. Now, what usually happens is maybe they sold some property or decided to donate an investment for, for whatever reason, say they support your church or 3ABN or whatever. So, but what happens in big jar giving is when someone really is emotionally, maybe they say, wow, this, they're watching 3ABN, you give Pastor John this great project going on, or Jill, one of you, and the people say, I really want to do something special. So that's when we dig into the big jar instead of the little jar. So I believe this kind of giving is given by the Holy Spirit's prompting. It really is. Because, why? Because it's not only a larger gift than normal, but it's also the matter of the timing that it comes in. We see it over and over and over. Uh, it, we call it just in the nick of time gift, right? That confirms that God is at work and still in control as sometimes timing is everything. So here we're getting maybe $50 a month and suddenly you get a 10,000. Maybe that week we have a tremendous need. Someone else gives a large jar gift. And all of that coming together makes this just in the nick of time to, to be able to pay off the bills or whatever it is, start a new project, whether it's prison ministries, whatever the needs. So giving, this is totally different than what you were talking about, returning to God. So what is it that God expects out of us? So the Bible records in our lesson with the, of the large jar gift in numerous places. But today I want to read to you from John and you read with me, John 12, 1 to 8. And it records it like this. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Imagine that. He was dead some time before, and now he's at, eating and talking to Jesus. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, 
and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, I'm sure you've heard that name, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare whatever was put in it. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my bearing has she kept this. Jesus was telling us something. For the poor always you have with you, but me you don't always have. So Mary's gift was equal to a year's pay, about 300 denarii. So wow, talk about a liquid asset, her perfume, get it? All right, somebody got it. Okay. Perfume, right, the liquid <laughs> asset. But much more than the monetary value was the gift of her love to Jesus. In their culture at that time, guest feet were washed by having a basin of water, and often they put a little bit of perfume in that just, well, you know how feet would smell when you're in sandals and uh, you, you know the rest of the story. We won't, we won't get too much into that. Mary wasn't settling for the small jar of sacrifice. She literally poured out a pound of this nard over Jesus' feet and washed it with her hair. This was a big sac sacrificial gift, big jar gift. Following this incident, look to the contrast. Judas betrayed Jesus for a little more than one third of that amount, 30 pieces of silver. The contrast between the two, Mary and Judas, could not be more pronounced. Mary is generous, Judas is greedy. Mary is humble, Judas is arrogant. Yeah. Mary is selfless, Judas is self-centered. Mm -hmm. Judas stands aloof, Mary kneels in humble adoration. Mm -hmm. Together they serve as vivid, contrasting illustrations of Jesus' own teaching. Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. That's Matthew 6, 21. Jesus' re Jesus's rebuke of Judas comes to us as farther invitation to true discipleship, to turn away from all that is greedy, self-centered, and cold-hearted. For Mary's lavish gift is not just any perfume. It is perfume meant for Jesus' burial. Amen. Some critics might say, well, what about social justice? I mean, have mercy. Mary spent a year's wages on Jesus' feet rather than sharing it with the poor. And some say, well, what about Jesus? Shouldn't he have rebuked her for what she did? But here we learn. See, Jesus knew, we can see in the Gospel of John, he said repeatedly he knew he was going to die. Here we learn that Mary may have well sensed this too. She has purchased a burial ointment fit for a king. She pours it out as a way of announcing the hour has come. Hmm. In contrast to so many depictions of some of Jesus' followers as being clueless and then terribly disillusioned by Jesus' death, Mary here offers knowing devotion as though she knew what was going to happen. Mary's gift was real love and commitment put in action by her sacrificial giving to the Lord. But when we get greedy, like Judas, we can sell our souls for next to nothing. And we have to really be concerned. So one more time, Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart is right. also. Sacrificial giving is good for our, our own salvation. When you think about it, the whole plan of salvation is built on sacrificial giving. God giving his only begotten son to whosoever believeth in him should not perish, sacrificing his own son for sinful man. That sacrificial giving. Mm -hmm. So, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we should be willing to make great sacrifices for the cause of God. We have the truth. We have an end times message of the three angels' messages. It's an end times message for an end times people. It takes sacrifices to get this message into the entire world so Jesus can come back. Because when this gospel of the kingdom is preached into all the world, then Jesus returns. So, but we cannot outgive God. But I do want to say in closing here that I think the important big jar of giving we can give to the Lord is our time. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's is our time. It's not just the money. I mean, we're right. talking a lot about money today, but how much time do we spend with Jesus through Bible study and through, through prayer? Uh, how much time do we spend with our families? Mm -hmm. Lanny Wolf wrote a song that says, Only one life and soon it will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. So on behalf of 3ABN, I want to thank you for your love and your prayers, your financial support. 
whether it's the small gifts, whether it's the, the large gifts, again, it keeps us going and keeps us growing because we're not finished yet. Jesus is soon to come, but we have a great mission to accomplish, and that's to take this gospel of the kingdom into all the world. Amen. Wow, well, thank you, Danny. Wow, thank you, Jill. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Daniel. What closing thought do you have for us today? Well, I'd like to end where I began with Monday's lesson, and that's Psalm 73, 26. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The Lord being our portion won't end when Jesus comes and our gratitude and giving to God will also continue into eternity. We're just practicing now the life we will live in heaven. Amen. Right? Amen. You know, I started my lesson with telling a story about how someone had put a message out there that said, uh, if the love of money, or if, if the money is the root of all evil, then why is the church asking for it? But the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 10, or chapter 6, verse 10, that it's the desire, the love for money that is the root of all evil. You know what? Don't, uh, don't allow your greed, don't allow your selfishness to keep a tremendous blessing from you and from others when we hoard and selfish, uh, selfishly uh, uh, gain all of these riches for ourselves, and we don't allow to offer and to give to others, then we keep a blessing from ourselves and we prevent a blessing from going to others. Yeah. I think in my own heart, I've been convicted as we've gone through this lesson that offering and what we give to God matters. So if you're not sure where your heart is with God, I would encourage you to pray Psalm 139. Mm -hmm. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Mm -hmm. Try me, reveal to me my heart. And God wants to ch take our hearts and change and transform them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And my takeaway from this, you know, my mind was on big jar giving, but it's not the amount of money. It's not the amount of giving because it's not measured. God doesn't measure us by our monetary units, right? Aren't you glad for that? Amen. But he does hold us accountable for our time that he has given us. So we want to make sure the time that we have on this earth, that we use it to spread this great gospel of the kingdom into all the world. Wow. Amen. Well, thank you all for joining us. We are just getting started. This is lesson number four. We have a lot of lessons left, at least eight more, so we encourage you to stay with us. Next quarter or next week, we're going to be talking about dealing with debt. Wow, that's a big one today in a world where we are described as consumers. Is your consumerism consuming you? That's a question I want you to think about until next time. But here's a thought that I'd like you to end with. I'd like to end with Galatians 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap. Do not judge each of your days by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you plant. Mm -hmm. Ask the Lord, what am I planting? How is my planting gonna make a difference when eternity rolls? And here's a point that you cannot forget. You can give without loving, but it is impossible to love without giving. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us on Sabbath School panel. Every time you join us, it's a blessing. We look forward to seeing you next week for Dealing with Debt.